I am doing chapter summaries for this textbook right there. College Physics, John Batista, 5th edition. So just as a reminder, these are summaries. These are not the chapter. I would still read the chapter. I would still work the problems. But once you do that, this can help to look at the basic idea. Let's start with chapter 16. This is usually where the second semester of physics starts. And I'm going to start with this. Charges. So we have electric charges uh, and everything is made of electric charges. You know, and this is really kind of weird. Let's just write this. Those three things, if I represent this as a proton, an electron, and a neutron, which has a neutral charge, if you look around you, there are other things in, in the universe other than these three things. But everything that you deal with can basically represent it as these, a combination of these three things, which is just crazy if you think about it. But here we are, electron and proton. So uh, about these are really, really tiny particles, and they are charges. And these both have the fundamental charge. So we use the symbol E to represent a fundamental charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So this has a charge of minus E, and this has a charge of plus E. Now, I should point out that there is such thing as something that's like an electron, but it's positive. Uh, we call that a positron. And there is a negative electron, a proton, which we call an antiproton. Um, so just so you know that those things do exist, but most of the stuff that you see are, are these three things. Okay, so uh, charge is, matter is made up of, of charges because they're made up of atoms. Uh, and it is possible to transfer charges. Uh, I should, there's a great FET simulation I should show you, but let's just suppose that I take um, a balloon and someone's hair. And I rub these two together. It turns out that I can transfer charge from one to the other. And suppose that this balloon acquires a net positive charge. In that case, the hair will end up with a negative charge. We call this conservation of charge. We don't, you can create charge. You can create an electron, but you have to create an anti-electron with it so that the net charge is zero. And this is a conservation of charge. You can't just destroy, again, you can destroy charge. You can destroy charges with another charge, but the net charge has to be constant. One of the important things about this is that when I transfer charge such that one of these is positive and one's negative, uh, it's the negative charges in almost every case it gets transferred. If you think about uh, material made making a balloon, let's say it's got carbon, the, the positive charges are in the nucleus. You can't take an, a proton out of the nucleus without doing something really crazy because that's a nuclear reaction. But you can take the electrons out. So if I want to make these negative, I'm actually transferring negative charges in almost every case from the balloon to the hair. So now I end up with a fewer electrons here and extra, extra electrons over there. There's still electrons here, but this, I'm just showing the net charge. Now, I do want to point out one other important thing about charges, and that's the difference in materials for an insulator and a conductor. An insulator is materials like rubber, wood, glass, plastic. Uh, and in these cases, charges don't easily move. No movie. And in a conductor, charges can move. This means that in a conductor, any excess charge is going to be on the surface. Whereas an insulator, you can have the charge spread throughout the whole thing. Uh, let me show you really quick an example. I don't know if you can see this. This is a piece of acrylic. I'm going to hold it up to the camera. And you see that? That looks cool, huh? It's like a little tree inside of it. So this acrylic is made in a particle accelerator. What they do is they bombard this with high energy electrons. And since this is an insulator, those electrons get stuck throughout the whole thing. And then they take a wire and they ground it. 
And this allows all those electrons to escape, but when they do, they melt the plastic. And so you're left with this thing that looks like lightning, and it's kind of awesome. You like that? Okay. So that's an insulator. Charges can move, but only if you melt the stuff, essentially. And, and in a metal, the charges can move. Cannot move, can't move. And so in a conductor, the charges are going to be on the outside. Okay. Let's talk about the two most important things in this chapter. Uh, the Coulomb's Law and electric fields. So suppose I have two charges. I'll call that one Q1. I'll call that one Q2. It could be minus, it could be positive, it doesn't matter. And they're separated by a distance R. There will be an electric force interaction between them, F pulling them together, like that. And the magnitude of that force, this is a vector force, but I'm drawing it as a scalar because that's the way the book does it. The magnitude of that force is equal to K Q1 Q2 over R squared, where K is a constant of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons meter squared per coulomb squared. And if you remember from before, the gravitational force between ob two objects looks like this, m1, m2 over r squared. It looks like it's the same form. Of course, these are actually vectors, um, and so they're in this case, the, the force on charge 2 is to the left, the force on charge 1 is to the right, but Newton's third law, it's an interaction between these two charges, so they have the same magnitude but opposite direction. You can write this as a vector equation. This book does not do that. I'm going to do it anyway. I don't, I don't expect you to know this, but I just, I just want to. So if I have um, two charges in space, let's do this the best way. Here's Q1. Here's Q2, so we'll call this the vector R1, call this the vector R2, and this is the vector R. So R is equal to the vector R2 minus R1. Then I can calculate a unit vector R, R hat, which is the vector R divided by the magnitude of the vector R. Then I can write the equation F of, let's call this 1, 2. This is the equation of the force of 1 on 2 vector is equal to k q1 q2 over the magnitude of r squared times r hat. Now you'll notice that if one of these charges is negative, then this force is going to be in the op this is going to be a negative number, and so this force will be in the opposite direction of r hat. So it'll be that way, it'll be an attractive force. If they're both negative, then it'll be pushing away and it'll be an, a, a repulsive force. If, if they're both positive, repulsive force. And that's the big difference between these two. G, the gravitational constant, super small. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th meters, newtons meters squared per kilogram squared, 10 to the negative 11th, 10 to the 9th. Of course, they're different units, but still the magnitude is huge. This is very, very weak, but always attractive. This is very, very strong, but could be attractive or repulsive. Now, there's another thing. Superposition. Suppose I have uh, the... We'll get to superposition when we get to electric fields. So let's talk about electric fields. Um, so suppose I have a charge, Q, and I put a tiny little test charge right there, Q2. And I calculate the force on this as F, as a vector. And then I divide by the magnitude of that charge. So I'm actually finding the force per unit charge due to this right here. So I can call that the electric field. It is the force divided by the ch test charge, not that charge. So this is a uh, property of this particle. If I put a different charge there, I can calculate the force by just multiplying the electric field by that. And since the force depends, I know the expression for that, the magnitude of this electric field is K Q over R squared. It's still a vector, 
Okay, but that's how we find that. This is the same thing that we do in uh, for gravity, right? If I have an object right here, M, and I want to calculate the gravitational force, I would say Fg equals Mg. Or I could say G equals Fg over M, and G is the gravitational field, uh, 0, negative 9.8, 0 newtons per kilogram. And so this would be electric field in newtons per coulomb. It's the force per unit charge. That's the force per unit mass because the gravitational force depends on mass. The coulomb force depends on charge. So let's look at uh, the idea of superposition now. Suppose I have a charge right there, Q, and I have another charge, Q1, and I have another charge right here, Q2. It's positive also. And I want to find the electric field right here. The electric field obeys the principle of superposition. So I'm going to write it out again. This says that the electric field right here is the sum, the vector sum of the electric field due to charge 1 and charge 2. So the char electric field due to charge 1 might be like this, E1. The electric field due to charge 2 would be like that, E2. So then if I add those two together, I get an electric field E like that. And so you can do that for any number of charges, as many or as few as you like. And this leads to the last very big idea, new piece of paper. There are some special cases of charges. And there's a whole bunch of great cases, but they're difficult to derive without using calculus. And so I'm not going to do that. Um, but here are a couple cases. Number one is a, is a sphere. Suppose I have a sphere with a total chart with a total positive charge on the surface, or spread out. It doesn't matter. This has to be uh, uniform. Actually, it only has to be spherical, but uniform charge. Then over here, the electric field, a distance r from the center, would be k q. This total charge, capital Q over r squared. It looks like a point charge. If you're outside the sphere, it looks like a point. Everything's concentrated at the center. That's important. If you're inside and the charge is only on the surface, the electric field is zero inside. If it's uniformly distributed through the inside, that's not true. And so that's important because if it's a metal, the charges will all be on the surface. Um, and and the electric field inside would be zero. And that is true. The electric field inside of a metal conductor uh, in equilibrium will be zero. The other special case, you can't derive this. Well, you can, but I'll try to make a video showing you how to do this. Uh, suppose I have two parallel plates with equal and opposite charges on them, separated by a distance. Uh, what do they use in the book? Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far apart it is. Inside of here, we get a constant magnitude and direction electric field. And the magnitude of this field, E, is going to be Q over epsilon naught A. So A is the area of one plate. Q is the charge on one plate. And that's kind of a big deal. And we actually call this a capacitor, uh, a parallel plate capacitor. Parallel plate capacitor. Capa but we'll look at that later. But it's important because it's one way for us to create constant electric fields, and we can deal with situations with constant electric fields much easier than more complicated cases of non-constant electric fields. Let's see, is there, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff, but I think that's the most important thing. Um, here's what I did, I don't think are important in this chapter. Electric field lines. These are just a way of representing the electric field by just drawing continuous lines instead of individual arrows. It's not a big deal uh, because we can easily create electric field plots now with a computer. So we don't really need that. Um, so I'm not, I don't really care about that. The other one is electric flux with an L, which is fun to say. Um, and this is, we use the symbol phi for that. And this is important when we get 
later when we talk about electric and magnetic interactions. But for now, we don't need that because it's really just there for another thing that we're not going to use, Gauss's law. Gauss's law is a way to describe the pattern of field around an object and to determine it using symmetry. But it's actually kind of complicated. It uses integration. And since this is an algebra-based course, I don't think that we need to do that. It actually uses a vector surface integral, which, I mean, come on. We don't want to do that. And a lot of times, classes will have Gauss's law in the beginning. But it's just a, it's just a parlor trick, really. And it's not really, you can't really understand it. So I don't want to do it. We will talk about it later conceptually when we get to electromagnetic interactions. But for right now, let's just leave it as pass. Okay, so that's chapter 16, the end.